Hello, everybody. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 6? And we're actually going to start in verse 10. And as you're going there, why don't we turn to the Lord in prayer? Father, thank you for this time that we can look into your word and we can study the truth about the kingdom, the kingdom that you have promised and one that we live in anticipation for. Lord, I'm anxious for how this this entire conference is going to impact people's lives, especially today and right now as we look at the words of Jesus, the Messiah, and his, his, his life and how he lived out uh, uh, um, the coming of the kingdom, Lord. And so we're thankful for everything that you have given to us, your word, as it changes us, Lord. And that's our biggest imp- uh, uh, prayer today is that it would impact our lives and change us uh, for what's coming in the future, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say a prayer really quick that Jesus actually said that I think is going to define a lot about what he, Jesus came to earth uh, in order to bring the kingdom. The kingdom becomes very important, and I want to try to build some bridges, some bridges between the Old Testament and what the Old Testament was teaching about the kingdom, and then how Jesus was ultimately coming and preaching the kingdom and living out the kingdom as he walked this earth. So if you turn with me and look in Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 9 and 10, I'll start in, uh, in verse 9, uh, it says this, Uh, Then this is how you should pray, Jesus says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here, Jesus, in his prayer uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, is giving an incredibly important message on and prayer on how we should uh, pray to the Lord. And one of the defining uh, um, moments here in this prayer is Jesus saying, Lord, we want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And this becomes important in understanding what Jesus is doing here to begin with with the kingdom. Uh, The kingdom isn't something that Jesus is making up along the way. This isn't something that Jesus is inventing. I think a lot of times we think Jesus invented Christianity or uh, that he created this whole thing. No, Jesus is coming as a result of what Uh, Moses spoke about as a a result of what the prophets had promised, a kingdom. And Jesus is coming as a result of this to bring the kingdom. So the question is, why would Jesus say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Well, it's really interesting because when you go back to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah gives us a a beautiful picture of this coming kingdom, the turmoil of what's going on in the world, sin, how sin has corrupted everything, but then ultimately that God would provide a suffering servant, Isaiah 53, that would ultimately bring a kingdom. And in the very end, uh, Isaiah 66 verse 1 says this. Listen to this. It says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And so Isaiah is saying that God's kingdom is, is uh, in heaven. It's always stayed that way. God's kingdom has always been in heaven. His throne is in heaven. But notice what he says. Earth is my footstool, which means if you get that picture, it's like a king sitting on his throne and his footstool connects his feet. His body connects with the footstool. Earth is his footstool. There was supposed to be a connection, a link between what was going on in God's kingdom in heaven and on earth, that there was a connection between what God was doing in heaven and that connection on earth. But the problem is, is that connection has been broken. And it's been God's desire to restore that connection. And that's why Jesus' prayer, the, 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 the main thrust of his prayer in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 6 is what? It's that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bind these things together again, Lord. Bring unity between the kingdom, your throne in heaven, and your footstool on earth. As Isaiah 66 Uh, Verse one says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And if you really want to get particular, talking about what the prophets thought about the footstool, it's of course earth. But then at the same time, uh, when you read through the prophets and you understand why Jesus is coming and saying this, again, Jesus isn't just making this up. Jesus is saying that not only is earth his footstool, but actually the prophets will say that Jerusalem is, the temple itself is the footstool 
uh, of the Lord. So again, heaven is where God's kingdom has always been. It's never been shaken. It's the foundations. It's, 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 it's never been upended. God is in control and sovereign over everything and his throne uh, is in heaven. And what is going on? Jesus has come as the prophets had promised to what? Restore that link, that bond that it should exist between God in heaven on his throne and earth as its footstool. And that is the reason why Jesus prays this incredibly important prayer, which is our father, in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know today uh, that Jesus, yes, he is ruling and reigning. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father even today. But we also know that Satan still has dominion over this earth. And so we're still waiting for this anticipation, this connection between what's going on in heaven, God's throne, his sovereignty at his throne in heaven, and his footstool, which is earth. We're waiting for that link to happen. And so this is going to be something important as we study, because not only are we seeing it in Matthew chapter 6, but it's fascinating because when Jesus actually uh, is speaking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, uh, uh, and he talks about building his church, he does give some interesting connections there as well. He says in Matthew 16 verse 19 that as a result of the birth of the church, there will be this unique connection between the believer uh, and, 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 uh, and the kingdom that what is bound on heaven will be uh, bound on earth and what is ultimately loosened in heaven will be loosened in earth. That there's, there is this connection that does matter um, in Matthew chapter 16. Again, there's that unique connection between heaven and earth. It is still broken at this point, but Jesus is going to be the one to come and to restore it. And so I want to take a look at some of these concepts because Jesus is going to come into this earth. He's going to be born according to what the prophets had promised, according to the kingdom. Remember, when the prophets were speaking about a Messiah coming, a suffering servant, or the fact that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, or that he would be born a virgin, all these amazing prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, those were all prophecies, not just about a coming Messiah, but they were prophecies about a coming kingdom. In order for a kingdom to come, you need a king. And that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's born into this earth. He comes as the king of Israel, the one who would bring uh, the kingdom and who would ultimately rule over the kingdom. And so what happens is Jesus comes and he begins to preach about the kingdom. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 17. And you can see this right here because when Jesus comes, he does exactly what the prophets had done in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he says this, from that time on, uh, Jesus began to preach. So Jesus is going into full ministry mode right now. And so what's he preaching about? He's saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Or maybe your translation might say, the kingdom of God is near. I'm the king of the kingdom, and I am coming to let you know you need to repent and turn back to the Lord. This is, again, not unique. This is not unique. This is exactly what John the Baptist was doing, and this is exactly what the prophets were doing. Uh, When the prophets were screaming out loud, Israel, return to the Lord. Your sin has driven you away from the Lord. And in doing so, God's going to rip the kingdom from you. He's going to scatter you around the world. It'll be the times of the Gentiles that come in. If you, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, it's exactly what the, what the prophets were, were saying. It's exactly what John the Baptist was saying when he was doing a baptism of repentance, a repentance to turn back to the Lord so that God could do what? restore the kingdom. Well, here is Jesus going from city to city, announcing something just as the prophets had done in the Old Testament, which is very interesting. He's telling everyone uh, in all of Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's, it's at hand. It's, 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 you can almost taste it. It's right here. Why can you taste it? Because I am the king of the kingdom. And I'm here to bring it, the kingdom for you. All that was promised in the Old Testament, all that was promised to, uh, from Abraham to Moses to David and the prophets, all of these things have been uh, met in me since I am the king. And I'm here to let you know, repent, because that kingdom, you can almost taste it. I'm the one who can bring it if you repent and turn. 
But, but this becomes the problem throughout the Gospels as we think about the trajectory of, of God's kingdom in, 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 in Jesus' um, life on earth and his ministry on earth. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, something interesting happens. You know, there's a transition. You have all this account of Jesus' life and his ministry, starting from Matthew chapter 1, his birth narrative, his genealogy. Uh, then you move into uh, the fact that God has called him. He goes out and he does his ministry. He finds his 12 disciples. He begins to do ministry in the various cities. He sends his disciples out. And then what happens? They begin to come back in, and all of a sudden, people begin to question Jesus. Is this guy really the Messiah? And, and he finds difficulty as he's saying, repent, turn, for the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom ne is near. You can almost taste it. What happens? Instead of people going, we're with you, Jesus, the disciples are following him. He does have a lot of followers. But there's an interesting moment in Matthew chapter 12 where now all of a sudden something fascinating happens. There's a rejection that begins to take place. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, if you want to turn there, this becomes interesting because now Jesus is not just uh, uh, the, big, uh, the big maher, as we would say, the one that everybody's looking to follow and trust in. No, actually what happens is there's a turning away from Jesus among his people. Jesus admits that he had come for the house of Israel. Jesus admits that he had come to minister to the Jewish people, that they might repent and turn, and that they would believe in him. But now all of a sudden, there is a moment in this, in this narrative of the kingdom as Jesus is bringing it. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, it, it says this, but when the Pharisees heard this, uh, they said, you know, after they see an uh, 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 individual get healed, the Pharisees are questioning this healing that takes place that Jesus did, and they say this. Now listen, they say in verse 24 of Matthew 12, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Think about that for a minute. It is only by, they're, Satan, they're saying it's only by Satan, Beelzebul is Satan. It's only by Satan and his kingdom that this man, Jesus, is the one casting out demons. Now you have to think about this for a moment because this is a crucial, critical moment in the, in the narrative of, of the gospel of Matthew. Matthew puts this here on purpose so that we see a rejection that takes place. There's a rejection to the kingdom that Jesus is offering. You know, if you notice even in the Old Testament, as you read through the Old Testament, it's not like God just forces the kingdom on his people. No, there's always got to be a response from his people to accept the kingdom. Even from the very beginning, when you go back to when Moses was uh, ministering to the Israelites and leading them, it was a choice that the Israelites had to make in order to follow God. And they agreed to be the ones that would be in a covenant relationship with them. It would be the prophets who would say to Israel, turn back to the Lord. It's your choice now to turn back and repent and God will restore all these things to you if you repent. It was a choice they had to make. It was a choice that Israel had to make, even in this moment in Matthew chapter four, when he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And finally, we see that choice lived out here when the Pharisees, who are the ruling spiritual class of Israel, uh, the Pharisees were an interesting little, uh, uh, not little, they were huge actually, their most popular party in Israel. Everybody kind of trusted and turned to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very religious people. They were very uh, orthodox in following the laws and the prophets. These were the ones that would have invested their time in studying the prophets. And here they are, people trusted the words of the Pharisees. They didn't trust the words of the Sadducees, who were actually the ruling class, but they did trust the other party. They trusted the words of the Pharisees. Pharisees held fast to what the word of God had taught. And here they are, the Pharisees are the ones saying, oh, this Jesus? Uh, this guy who's healing, this guy who is, is speaking and teaching about the kingdom, it, it doesn't come from God above. Remember, linking heaven and earth, that God's throne is in heaven and earth is its footstool. That, this connection that you're seeing as Jesus is ministering and he's healing, this doesn't come from God. This comes from Satan himself. Now, what happens here is interesting. It shows a huge rejection from the leading ruling class of, of Israel who were leading and guiding the spiritual hearts of the people of Israel. They were the ones turning away. They were the ones that were ultimately rejecting the kingdom. 
And this becomes interesting because when you actually read in the Old Testament, uh, Zechariah does tell us about the moment that Israel repents and turns to the Messiah. He, it, it, Zechariah 12.10 does talk about it. He, he says this in Zechariah 12.10, it mentions the day that Israel repents and turns to the Messiah and God's kingdom comes. This is what it says in Zechariah 12.10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, that's an Old Testament passage, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. If you jump down to verse 12, it talks about all the people who will repent and turn when they see Jesus. Listen to all the people who repent and turn. The land shall mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the the, uh, Shemites by itself and their wives by themselves and all the families that are left, each by itself and their wives by themselves. So when you read through Zechariah and the actual repentance, because Zechariah does give us a prophetic vision for the repentance that will take place when Israel does turn and believe in the Messiah and then the kingdom does come in, you see what happens here. Who believes? Everyone. From when they talk about David and his family, look at David's been dead for a long time when, when the prophet is writing this. He's talking about the king, the king and his family, the advi- Nathan, a, a prophet, the prophets and all the advisors of the kings and their families will repent. The Levites, the priests will turn and repent. All the way down to who? All the way down to the average family, the average Joe will all turn, and and it even highlights even their wives, which means even the wives who normally would look to the husband and say, you go to the temple on our behalf, you bring the offering on the behalf of the family, you offer the sacrifices, you are the head of the household. Here's Zachariah saying, it's not just the husbands, it's even the wives who are crying out in repentance as they look upon him whom they have pierced. So what's going on here? We're seeing that There's still an anticipation for what will happen with Israel because from Matthew chapter 12, we're seeing that the Pharisees, the religious ruling class of that time, had rejected Jesus for the most part. Not all of them, but a vast majority of them. And so this actually causes Jesus to change, uh, not that Jesus was caught off guard, but this will change the way that Jesus will speak to his disciples and to his followers. If you notice prior to Matthew 12, if you ever read through the Gospels, Jesus is speaking very plainly to the entire house of Israel. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's coming. But now all of a sudden, Jesus begins as a rabbi had, rabbis have done for a long time. And even in the Old Testament, he begins to speak in parables. I want to read from a great theologian here. His, his name um, is uh, Craig Keener. And he says this, Uh, as Jesus is going to transition in Matthew 13 and all of a sudden begins speaking in parables, he says parables were not meant to explain a rabbi's point by illustrating it. However, if the point were not stated, the parable would amount to no more than a story. Rabbis had some more secretive teachings that they thought only their closest disciples could handle. And they reserved these for private instruction. The meaning of Jesus' parables then would be understood only by those who chose to become insiders. So what's happening is that Jesus, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, speaking to all of, the, um, all of Israel, speaking to all of them, notices a rejection that takes place. And what happens? He turns toward his disciples and those who follow him, not just his 12, but those who follow him. And he begins to speak to them in parables so that when you switch the page, now what happens? In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives us several different parables about the spiritual condition that will take place from his rejection from not only Matthew 12, but from when the ultimate rejection happens. He is rejected by his people and he's put on the cross. He dies, resurrects, and then ascends into heaven. What about from that moment until the second coming? 
This becomes important because Jesus is going to speak into all of these things. There are several different parables that I want to go through that highlight the today. Jesus didn't forget about today. It's not like Jesus was just thinking, here I am on earth, and now I'm thinking about the kingdom that's coming. No, there's the today. What will happen spiritually as a result? The kingdom was rejected, uh, which has happened in the Old Testament. The kingdom was rejected, and now what? Well, Jesus gives these parables to give us insight into not only what is going on in his time, but ultimately what will happen after his death, burial, and resurrection into the church age leading up to his second coming, leading up to the kingdom. They're kingdom mysteries, things that the the disciples didn't read about in the Old Testament. It's a mystery. The first is this, and you've probably heard many, many different uh, messages on it, Um, and it's this, and I'll I'll highlight this. I have a little chart that you're uh, looking at right now, which highlights the the trajectory of these kingdom mysteries. Uh, Israel's rejection in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, and then an interim period, which is what we would call the church age from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and then ultimately leading up to the second coming of Jesus, Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. And I love what Dr. Andy Wood says about this. He says, Matthew 13's eight parables reveal a complete picture of the mystery age. And so really quick, I want to highlight some of these because you might have read through them and maybe this will give some more definition as it comes as a result of our study here of the kingdom. Number one, I'm sure you're familiar with the sower. Uh, The sower, which says as Jesus comes and he sat by the lake and there was a large crowd around him and then he begins to speak to them in parables and he says a farmer goes out to sow his seed and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came up and ate it and some fell on the rocky places where it didn't have much soil. And it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it, was, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And so what's Jesus saying? He's talking about the fact that during this mystery age, because the kingdom has been rejected, in this mystery age, From this moment until the second coming, the gospel is going to be received differently all throughout the world as the soil of one's heart is being prepared a certain way. The gospel message will fall on people's hearts differently. It means the gospel message will be spread. This doesn't end the spread of the good news of the kingdom. This doesn't, this doesn't end the message of the good news of what we're sharing. It actually means it will fall differently on the hearts of the people, something that we're seeing already from Matthew chapter 1 uh, through 12. That will continue on as we continue to share the good news of the coming kingdom. Uh, it will fall differently, and we have to be prepared for that as we go out and minister. Not everyone's going to say yes. Not everyone's going to say no. And for those who do say yes, there could be uh, issues in life that come up that drive them away. And for those who say no, again, it drives them away from the gospel. The idea that the gospel goes out and the heart has to be prepared by God a certain way, that soil has to be tilled a certain way. The other one is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, which talks about the wheat and the tares. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came in and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the the weeds come from? And the enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go up and pull them out? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat that's with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell, you the har- uh, tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring uh, it into my barn. Here's the picture. Again, during this mystery age, uh, there's going to be believers and unbelievers that will be together. And actually, even among professing Christians, there will be the wheat and the tares. And the picture is this, is that these events will take place to what? The second coming, that's the harvest. That's what he's talking about when Jesus returns, a judgment that takes place. So again, the second coming of Christ is revealed in this truth, in this 
mystery age. It goes on, it talks about a mustard seed. Uh, uh, in, in verse 31, it says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is smaller of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. The idea of this small, tiny seed, something that st starts super, super small, grows into one of the largest garden plants. It actually becomes a place of haven for people. The idea of the growth of the church that will take place in number and geographically, that there is a growth, not of the kingdom. The kingdom doesn't grow. The church will be growing as in a picture of this mustard seed. Again, Jesus highlights leaven. He says this in verse 33 when he says, and he told him another parable right away. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it was worked all through the dough. Now here's something that's interesting is that this is, Actually, a lot of people go, see, look, again, a picture of the growth of the church. No, actually, leaven in the Bible is never a positive thing. It's actually quite a, a negative thing in, in, the, uh, in the Bible. Leaven is associated with sin. And so here, Jesus, in this parable, is talking about deception that would come into the church. Uh, it, we read about this even in 1 Timothy 4.1. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, um, there, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to the de deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That, that even you have to be careful about this leaven that will infuse itself into the church because it will spread and grow. And so there's a picture of leaven that's there that even Jesus speaks into about bewaring of, uh, beware of false teachers and false messiahs. And so again, that will take root uh, within the church. Uh, there are several others, like a picture of Israel in the church. When you look at the study of the hidden treasure in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, and the pearl of great price from Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Uh, also, the net, the idea that again, co uh, from Matthew 13, another parable that talks about the coexistence of believers and unbelievers through this mystery age, but that will finally once be taken care of at the second coming. And, and finally, that one of the owner of the house in Matthew chapter 13, these kingdom mysteries that should be considered not just in and of themselves, but that we find them in the Old Testament, the truths in the Old Testament, as God reveals this mystery, and it ultimately is revealed in the coming of Christ at his second coming. All of these things are to give a picture, the parables, again, Jesus speaking specifically to his people about, about the kingdom of the future kingdom, but what about right now? What about the fact that, yes, the kingdom was rejected? We see that. Now, that, that's going to be developed later on in the New Testament. We're going to get a picture of what it meant uh, for, for God. Did God make a mistake when the Israel or when the Jewish people rejected Jesus? No, he didn't make a mistake. That, that will get revealed as the, apostles Paul, the Apostle Paul and the other apostles speak about why Jesus came and the coming of the kingdom. But for Jesus, this is a monumental moment when he begins to shift away from speaking to all of his all of Israel, and he hones in on his disciples, speaking to them in parables about this mystery age that's coming that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, and how God's truth will continue through this church age, the spreading of the gospel, uh, the truth that will go on, on on how hearts are prepared as we minister to people to share still the good news of the coming kingdom. I believe Jesus's words are relevant today as they, much as they were when he, they, he spoke to them in Matthew 4, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I believe it's at hand at any moment. It's imminent. It will happen at any moment. Our, the truth, the good news that we're sharing is the good news that we have been forgiven from our sins and we can have a relationship with the Lord, especially when his kingdom returns to earth. This is so incredibly important. When God binds, think about it, when he once again connects heaven and earth, when earth becomes his footstool and Jesus rules and reigns from Jerusalem forever. But, but I want to highlight this really quick before we end on the kingdom. You know, when, when you study the Old Testament and you move into the New Testament, something that's interesting that you see is that Jewish people, uh, the, Israel, uh, the Jewish people living during the days of Jesus, they, they didn't like Rome. 
you, you know, when, when you study a lot of what was going on and, and the literature that was coming up during the time of Jesus, what you'll find out is the Jewish people didn't like Rome. They blamed Rome for everything. This is the reason. Ro- Rome is the reason, the, the problem with everything. But what's fascinating is that when you get to the Gospels and you study Jesus, especially as he teaches about the kingdom, there's nothing said about Rome. Jesus doesn't speak about Rome at all. He speaks about whether or not we should pay taxes to Rome. But even then, it's nothing bad. It, Jesus doesn't speak negatively against Rome because you know what Jesus is trying to tell the Israelites or trying to tell the Jewish people in this time as he's, as he's preaching to them? He's saying to them, Rome is not the problem. Rome has never been the problem when you think about the kingdom. See, Rome was never the issue to begin with. The problem, this is what Jesus is going to do, it's your problem. You need to repent and turn back to God. See, when you study the words of Jesus about the kingdom, especially when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, you'll notice something. It was never just about the outward laws. It was about how those, what God was doing would change the inward heart. God was begging his people to return to him. It was never about the kingdoms on the outside. God would handle that. You think Rome is God's problem? No, Rome was never God's problem. It was the heart of his people. And by the heart of his people turning to him, the kingdom would come. That's always been the promise of the prophets. That's always been the promise of Jesus. And so when you see something that's amazing, it was never about Rome. As much as we like to highlight Rome, as much as we like to look at these Gentile kingdoms that were constantly pressuring Israel, constantly pressuring the Jewish people, I'm sure they were very angry. There were entire political parties during the days of Jesus that were meant to overthrow Rome. They wanted to relive the Maccabee moment when they were able to defeat the the other Gentile nations. Now we can do it too. There were the zealots. There were all of those religious political parties that thought they could overthrow Rome. And you know what? Jesus had nothing to do with that. Jesus had to do with the spiritual condition of his people. That's what they didn't want to hear. That actually the kingdom would come. The coming of the kingdom in Jesus's mind is not predicated on whether or not we're going to defeat the Gentile uh, kingdoms that surround us. No, it actually all begins from what the what the law had said in the very beginning, it starts with you and your relationship with the Lord. Jesus was more concerned with the inward heart of his people and making sure that they would turn, repent, and come back to God. Then God would work it so that the kingdom would come into fruition. But it all starts with exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. The first thing you have to do, repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You have to admit something. You have to admit it's not Rome that's the problem. It's not Caesar that's the problem. The problem is us. That's what's going on. That's what Jesus is saying. It's with our people. You must repent and turn back to God, and then God's going to do something amazing just as he promised in the Old Testament, in the law. I will restore the kingdom. But first, you have to return to me. Because Rome's not the problem. Hey, Greece wasn't the problem. Persia wasn't the problem. You know what else wasn't the problem? Uh, uh, Babylon and Assyria. These people, these are just, these are just players. The problem was that you turned from me to begin with. God and and what he's going to do with Israel and the kingdom, as it even moves forward from Jesus into the New Testament, is all going to be predicated on the exact same response. Repent. You have to admit that you were wrong and God was right. Repent and turn to me. It's a hard word that we don't hear that often in our society. Repent, which means you have to admit something. You were wrong and God was right. Repent and turn. That's exactly what Jesus is speaking. But in the meantime, as we're waiting for this kingdom to come, because we believe it's going to come, Jesus is also saying in this mystery age, This will be a time for us as believers to share the good news. And it's not all going to fall on the same hearts. And even within the churches, there will be people who are professing believers, but they're really not believers. We have to make sure we're teaching the truth of God's word because the leaven can work its way in. All of these amazing parables that teach us not only to just read the New Testament, but also to rely on what the Old Testament taught. We can't understand the New Testament 
apart from the Old Testament. All of these amazing truths that will take place. Why? Because there is a mystery age that came. Jesus was rejected, but there's a purpose to it. It's to make sure that the whole world has the opportunity to do what? To repent. To repent and turn to the goodness of who God is. Because there is a day coming when his kingdom will return.